Welcome to this month's edition of Live from Nora Lab. My name is Jamika Marshall, and I am a Nora Lab Outreach Assistant at the International Gemini Observatory here on the Big Island of Hawaii. Okay. The result? So the International Gemini Observatory is actually one of five programs of NSF's Nora Lab, which is the preeminent U.S. National Center for Ground-Based nighttime optical and infrared astronomy. Gemini Observatory is composed of twin telescopes. Gemini North, located here on the Big Island of Hawaii on Mauna Kea at an altitude of just about uh, 4,000 meters, just a little over 4,000 meters at 13,382 feet. And Gemini South, which is located on North Central Chile's Cerro Pachon. Now, Gemini's telescopes observe in the visible and infrared light. Gemini's eight meter, it's about 26 feet uh, reflectors collect this light with mirrors that are coated with a special layer of protected silver rather than aluminum, which is the more traditional coating for large telescopes. The mirror is made of ultra low expansion glass and is about 20 centimeters thick centimeters thick. Gemini has large vents that are opened at night to help observations because the cold air flows through producing more stable images. Now, because Gemini is actually located in the Northern and Southern hemispheres, we're actually able to observe the entire night sky. And I will have that video in the, um, in the chat for those who are interested. Now for our science highlight today. And today's science highlight, the ruins of an ancient star cluster found at the Milky Way's edge is actually the topic of today's presentation. Now, this is gonna give us a bit of background on what our guests are going to be speaking about today. It's really short, just a little over a minute. All right, here we go. So astronomers have discovered the ruins of an ancient star cluster in the outer fringes of our galaxy, the Milky Way. This stellar stream known as C19 extends across a large area of the sky that's approximately 30 times the width of the full moon. Now the stars in this stream have a uniquely low proportion of heavy elements, lower than any other stellar system in the Milky Way or its surroundings. Now this discovery was made using telescopes on the ground and in space. That includes the International Gemini Observatory, which is a program of NSF's NORA Lab. Now, here to tell us more about this ancient star cluster um, are today's three guests. So we'll start with Kim Finn. Now, Professor Kim Finn is, uh, she's a professor in physics and astronomy at the University of Victoria with an expertise in observational stellar spectroscopy and ground-based astronomical instrumentation and surveys. She was a Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics, as is Tier 2 from 2005 to 2015, and was awarded a Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering in 2000. Her main science interests include the chemodynamical analysis of stars in the galaxy and its nearby dwarf satellites to learn about galaxy formation and the origin of the elements. Kim is currently the director of the UVic Astronomy Research Center, director for uh, 
in CERC create training program on new technologies for Canadian observatories. And she also serves on the 30 meter telescope board of governors. Kim Vin, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, Tamika. That was really a nice introduction. Appreciate it. Um, well, we're uh, going to head to our second guest. I will introduce everyone and then we'll come back to you. Okay, so as you all see, we have a panel of guests today. Uh, and if you could stop your share really quickly, Kim, thank you. We will go over to John. I will hunt it, John. And so uh, our multiple guests here uh, is John Patzer. Now he's our second guest. And as you see, Kim will begin and we'll be transitioning throughout to give you this amazing story about C-19. So John Pazder is an optical designer and optical team leader at Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. He's been working on astronomical instrumentation for the past 30 years. The projects he has worked on include Altair, most, there's a lot. It includes JWST, TMT, GPI, um, Braces, Ghost, and Caster. So some of you who are longtime live from NORLAB uh, guests will probably recognize some of those instrument names, and John will be speaking on one of those in particular. Now, John's most recent project is Ghost, the Ghost Spectrograph, where he is the optical designer and project engineer for the Bench Spectrograph. He also has a minor planet named after him. This is 427695, and he is completing his PhD in astronomy at UVic. John, welcome. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. All right. And so last but certainly not least is going to be, oops, sorry, is going to be our, our, our last guest here running out the panel. And this is Andre Nicola Chene. So um, now those of you who have been here before know Andre Nicola. He has been on the show. I think this is your, I think I'm going to say this is your third appearance, maybe fourth. So a pro. All right. So uh, Andre Nicola Chene, who is making his third appearance. Yes, I have in my notes, was born on the 24th of February. So last week was his birthday in Quebec, Canada. He went to the University of Montreal and spent more than a dozen months observing at the Observatoire des Monts Magantique. Once he, granted, once he was granted a PhD, his work brought him to Victoria, British Columbia, then to Concepcion in Chile, followed by Valparaiso in Chile, before landing here in Hilo, Hawaii, eight years ago. Now, his passions are equally shared between the study of the wind of massive stars, the observation of open stellar clusters, and the art of high-level support at modern observatories. Andre Nicolas Chene, welcome back to the show. Aloha, Kako. Aloha, Danica. It's good to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. And that, folks, is our panel of guests. Okay, now, Kim, let's begin with you and you, yes, please, and begin your share. Tell us more about this discovery that we saw in our science highlight. Uh, thank you. Everything good? You yes. The screen? Fantastic. Um, it is a pleasure. Uh, I would love to tell you about this discovery. Uh, first, though, I would like to acknowledge with respect that I'm speaking to you from the Lequ traditional ter territory of the Lekwungen peoples and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose traditional, whose relationships to this land continue to this day. Uh, and indeed, we are all here today to discuss this discovery of C-19 uh, and the important role that the Gemini Observatory played in revealing this ancient star cluster. So thank you very much for the introductions. 
So yes, what is C19? That's probably the first question. Uh, first of all, the simple answer is that it's the most metal poor star cluster that we have ever found. Uh, and it, we found it as a stream, which is very unusual. So this is a beautiful artist conception that the Noir Lab uh, artistic team made to try to give an idea of what it would look like. So if our galaxy sort of looks like this with uh, gas and dust and stars in it, then that sort of stream of red dots below it is, is representative of this stream of metal poor uh, galaxies, but uh, metal poor stars, excuse me, um, but as a stream. And the reason it's so important, uh, it's not so much that we're finding as a stream, the reason it's so important is because it's so metal poor. And in fact, it's so metal poor that we think that it must have formed from nearly pristine gas. That is gas that formed uh, very early in the universe, just after the Big Bang. And just for uh, your listeners, uh, this is the same sort of little sliver in time, just after the Big Bang and before galaxies really start forming, that the JWST uh, was, was designed for and launched um, just successfully on Christmas this past year. So it's, it's, a, it's a sliver in time that many people are interested in astronomy. And this is basically a fossil. We're finding a fossil from that time in this cluster, which tells us a lot about the conditions of the universe at that time. And this is why it's so interesting. So most people are not familiar with metals or what we mean by metals. So just to clarify, astronomers, we often joke that there's the astronomer's periodic table, which includes hydrogen, helium, and then everything else, and everything else we call metals. And by metals, that means all the good stuff that, that we live by, you know, the, the, the iron that's in our blood or the calcium that's in our teeth, you know, the oxygen that we're breathing or the silicon that's in our phones or in the... Uh, computer system that's allowing me to talk with you today. And to go from this, which is what we think the universe was like right after the Big Bang, to this, right, the, the standard periodic table the, of the, all the chemical elements, um, that this would, all of these other elements would have formed in later generations of stars. So after the Big Bang, there was hydrogen, helium, tiny little traces of lithium, and then something happened, structures started to form, galaxies started to form, stars started to form, or maybe stars first, and, and through the stars, through supernovae, and even later through merging things like neutron stars, this is how we built up this, uh, all these chemical elements. So if we really wanna study the early universe, we wanna study the metal poor galaxy. So th this is something that I, I'm on a team where we are trying to find metal poor stars and structures in our galaxy. And it's actually not that easy. They're not that many. Most stars in our galaxy are, are not very metal poor. They have metallicities that are more similar to the sun or within one tenth of the metallicity of the sun. So in this picture here, this was a, a diagram that our team made for the discovery of the C19 stream. This is color coding by metallicity, the total amount of metals, the known clusters of stars in our galaxy. So typically a cluster of stars is like in this beautiful picture here, a globular cluster, or star cluster. They can have a couple million stars that are all gravitationally bound together and end up making something that looks kind of like a sphere because the gravitational influence towards the center. And the color coding is shown here with a little legend on the side. So the things that are red would have the same metallicity as the sun. Uh, things that are yellow are about one tenth that metallicity. Things that are uh, green are about one one hundredth. Things that are teal colored would be about one one thousandth and our guys lying below that. So this, what, this makes it particularly exciting and particularly rare, really. It's the first time we've ever seen anything like this. To give you a comparison, uh, the, our little C19 cluster compared to other known star clusters in our galaxy uh, is, is so much more metal poor. So this is a logarithmic scale of metallicity where zero means the same metallicity as the sun, minus one is one tenth, minus two is one one hundredth, minus three is one one thousandth. You can see that all the clusters of stars that we know about, right up to the most metal poor one that we knew we just discovered two years ago, um, are all more metal rich than this little, little tiny C19 that we just found. It only has 0.05% solar metallicity, and therefore we think it is the most pristine ancient star cluster, a fossil from possibly even before, or at least when the Milky Way was forming. So it's a super exciting little thing. Uh, the way we get metallicity is interesting and important. Uh, the way we get metallicity 
is also how the Gemini Observatory participated in this. So we're all familiar with taking a, a prism uh, and putting it into a sunbeam and seeing a beautiful rainbow come out. And that's because white light from the sun goes into the prism and the higher density of the material in the prism actually breaks the light into its component colors and the, and the rainbow comes out. But if you have a really good prism and send it to a, a really high dispersion uh, detector, you can see not only this rainbow of color, but you'll start to see black lines on top of the color. And these black lines, if you were to trace, uh, trace the intensity of light versus wavelength, wavelength meaning from red to green, and then you, you go down in intensity when there's a black line and then go back up and down again when there's a black line, these black lines end up being called absorption lines. And this this uh, line across the top, the white line across the top is the way astronomers would represent the spectrum of a star. And I, and I just want, want you to marvel at this for a moment because this is the spectrum of the sun. And so we can, we can know then what the chemical composition of the sun is because that's what leads to these black lines without ever having to go to the sun or sending a robot and scooping some of that gas up. And this means that we can also look at the spectrum of stars in other galaxies. And we don't have to go there. We don't have to go back in time. We can actually figure out from something that's that's at the very edges of the universe. It's very old, like JWST is looking at, at high redshifts, very far distances in the universe to look at things early on, or to find a fossil that we can find in our backyard and look at now. We don't have to go and touch it. We can figure out what it's made of from its spectrum. So I wanted to show you, this is uh, some spectra of some of the stars that are in our little C19 stream. And this was taken at the Gemini Observatory. And it's the relative strengths of these different lines that tell us the composition of these objects. And I'll just quickly summarize that in this particular case, across the top, uh, all the bumping around up here is basically the noise that we have in the spectrum, uh, in spectral regions where there are no lines. But more or less, the lines themselves of the three objects that we observe first are identical in certain elements, are very close to identical, except for sodium. Sodium is the, these two lines here. The sodium abundances are so different uh, that this is actually a typical fingerprint of a very old globular cluster. And this led us to understand what the nature of this system was, and therefore that this is a fossil globular cluster from the early universe. So I just wanted to highlight that this observation was taken with the GRACES spectrograph, or better, I think we should rename it the Amazing GRACES spectrograph. This is a 270 meter optical fiber that John Pazder, another one of our speakers, uh, conceived of, designed and built. And um, it will take light from the Gemini Observatory and send it underground to an instrument at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So in this beautiful picture, here's the Gemini Observatory and the conduit that contains the optical fiber cable, and there's John. And then it picks up on the other side into the conduit that goes into the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to John for the rest of the story or for the next parts of this story. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen now. And I just want to confirm that everything's good. Okay, I'm John, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Grace's. Now, it may sound like pretty normal of fibers. They have those for all of your internet, but in astronomy, it's a little different because the fiber has to actually get the light through, but not lose a quality of light called brightness. The fiber actually has to get the light through and preserve the quality of that over this distance. Um, to give an idea, this 270 meters for um, some of you, it would be 880 feet or five and a half football fields. Now the light goes into this fiber, which is made of a material called fused silica, but it's like having eight to five and a half football fields thick of glass that this light is going through. And we're not losing all of that light because of small imperfections and everything. Now, why would we want to do such a thing? Well, this started about 2011, this, this project, and it was actually called an experiment because it was so risky. Uh, Jim and I really needed a high resolution spectrograph, but spectrographs take a long time to build. And these scientific ones are large instruments that will fill the whole lab. They take over five years, typically eight to 10 years to build, and they're expensive, cost millions of dollars. Now, why would we think this would work? Well, it turns out that Gemini Telescope, with those great silver coatings, 
works great for light from green through red. It reflects piles of that light. And fibers work great at these kinds of wavelengths. And CFHT is not that far, only five and a half football fields away. But why not? Well, fibers weren't known to actually work well for a lot of people in astronomy. They have a very bad reputation. Some say they don't work. And no one had actually successfully built a fiber for astronomy this long. So we look again at this picture and you can see, I hope that you can see my pointer, I think. Um, the light comes out from Gemini off the, off the telescope, goes through the conduit and comes back to this instrument called Espadon sitting at CFHT. Now the whole secret sauce here is that fiber, 270 meters long. And to build this, we had to develop a new way to polish the fibers, to bond the fibers into the ferrules. And we had to come up with a new casing and see that black stuff, it's called a conduit. And we had to have something that was slippier than Teflon so that the fiber wouldn't microbend or bunch up as that fiber was moved along, that pulled through it and as you move the fiber, it was not easy. Now you ask, okay, I hope there's some budding engineers out there, but how do you do this stuff? How do you engineer this? Well, I'll give you a trick, baby steps. If you want to engineer something that no one's done before, take that problem and break it up into baby steps. And here's some of the steps we did. In the lab, we figured, gosh, we got to figure out how to polish this fiber better. So we came up with a better way to polish the fiber and how could we measure it? And we kept iterating there and we had to think, think why was it not working and keep iterating. And once we got that working, the next thing is, it doesn't have to just work in the lab. You gotta test it thoroughly. You can see that styrofoam box. We cooled it down to the temperatures up at the observatory and we tested and we had fun and we got all of our laptops out and laid them out in the lab so that we could be running all the computers and, and have fun. But once we got it thoroughly tested so we knew it would work in the lab, when we got to the telescope, we tested things again. And on that right-hand side, you can see that there's a computer there and we're putting light into there. And that light is actually going through all the way to CFHD and then being measured by another camera over there to see, does it actually work? Now you say, why does it matter? You could just try it with a telescope. An amazing fact, telescopes cost a lot of money to operate. I think it, last I heard it was $60,000 a night. Well, it depends how you add up these numbers, but. Every minute on that telescope is costing a lot of money. So you want to use it wisely and make sure it works. So I'm going to show you a really fun video. This is a really fun thing. This is us pulling the fiber and putting it in to the conduit. Um, and this is a very proud moment. Now, of course, we wanted to be very careful that we didn't break anything and that it didn't get stuck halfway. So we're going to watch it go into this tube. And right now, we're at the Gemini telescope. And in a few seconds, we're going to start pulling. This will give you an idea of how far that 600, sorry, 880 feet is. Let's just speed it up about 2,000 times. It didn't go this fast in actuality. And I'll just, you know, we're about halfway now. Now I'll give you another fun fact. When we went to build this, we realized that the electrical system at Gemini wouldn't necessarily be the same as the electrical system at CFHT. So we actually had to put a break in the metal parts, the strands that were connecting this from one side to the other to make sure that someone wouldn't get electrocuted because one observatory might've been a slightly different potential difference than Okay, success, the fiber is through. And it was successful. Um, it worked, we were amazed. And as you can see, this wonderful picture was the day it worked and the people at the control room were so happy. And I was stationed halfway up the mountain, there at the top, it actually worked. And what's more important, it's not just to have something to work. But is it useful? 
And Kim's work demonstrates this. And as you can see in these graphs here, that little blue line, that is the spectrograph called high res on a 10 meter telescope. And here's our spectrograph over at the Gemini telescope, which is only eight meters in size. And again, from this green light up to this red light and infrared light, we are competitive. It's a useful instrument and it can do science. And the most puzzling thing we had the day it worked is we got 10% more light than we expected. But what's more important than it working is to have fun. And it was a lot of fun. So all you engineers out there taking up instrumentation astronomy, it's fun. And keep studying, keep thinking, and keep playing. That's the important thing. I'm gonna now pass it over to Andre Nicola. There you go, I was looking for my microphone. There you go. Do you see it well? Yes. Thank you. So John stops uh, halfway through the story because that's uh, where I had to uh, say farewell and, and thank him for all the great adventure we had so far at this point. But on my end, the story was not, uh, <laughs> that was not the end of my story there. So that was back in 2014, uh, getting to 2015. And uh, we were delivered um, a new instrument somehow. Um, now, the next step, if you want that instrument to be useful for the community is uh, to work a little harder after it's delivered and make sure that when a brilliant astronomer like, like Kim gets to have a great idea how to use instruments, all they have to do is to ask for what they need and we deliver it. And this needs for uh, the astronomers to be transparent. And uh, for them, we don't want them to see all the trouble that goes behind it too much because that's our job. So let's start here. Um, so from, from when um, Kim had her idea about chasing those metal four stars and uh, got time at a telescope. So first thing we have to make sure that works is that the telescope is working and the telescope goes to the right place uh, talks to the instrument. We have to make sure the instrument is in the right setup, that all the pieces are going to the right place. Uh, we need to make sure that we sequence all the uh, motions of the telescope, the instrument pieces, the dome, in such way that we target the right star, and we take the right image. Uh, and then uh, this sequencing will not just happen anytime. It has to happen at the right time. It has to happen when the stars are visible in the sky, when we have enough time to observing it, when the weather conditions are right. So for that, we need scheduling. And then the sequences, when, when everything comes together, when the telescope, the instrument, the schedule comes all together, the weather condition comes together, it has to be uh, observed with very minimal uh, amount of time required for uh, setting up. And that's not all. Uh, even after when it's observed and you got the data and uh, you have all those premises of all those future discoveries, you still have to process that data so you can do something useful for it. So all those steps involve in total about uh, 70 people. <laughs> and uh, all of those piece of equipment are of high technology with a lot of accuracy that needs to be done with high precision. And uh, so that's, that's the challenge that we're facing. Andre, I have a question here from the chat, if I may. Yes. And this is for all three guests. Uh, so the question is from Liz Fleming of the Memphis Stargazers. And she asks, can the views of, from the telescopes be accessed by the public? And if so, how? Ah, so can the public uh, have access to the telescope itself? Yes, kind of like, um, I think there's like the worldwide telescope where you can, you know, apply for time and the astronomers yeah. kind of use it and you can see the views. I assume that is, is that possible? 
So to, uh, in terms of seeing the views of the telescope, that is challenging if your expectation is to be able to put your eye in, a, in an eyepiece and look at the, at the sky. The reason why this is not happening, happening and this is not possible is that um, time is limited. Uh, and even though those telescopes are planned to be having a lifetime of decades, uh, during those decades, you still want to be very efficient with the time available, so you make discoveries. Um, and the time you put uh, on, on looking through an eyepiece is time that goes against, sadly, sometimes in life certain things are a zero-sum game, and time at the telescope is one. Um, plus, if I add to what I just said that, is um, there are better instruments to look with your eyes that have a better view of the sky than what uh, Gemini can provide because Gemini is such a big mirror that it gives you access to a very tiny part of the sky, which may not always be spectacular when you put your eye on. But that is, I started with the sad part of my answer. The happy side of my answer is that we're a public facility. So if you have an idea of um, science project you would like to uh, do with Gemini, there is a cycle starting actually today. Uh, for a month, people will be sending us their ideas of projects they want to do with us. And uh, if they are successful with their proposal, which will be evaluated by uh, peer astronomers, then they can have access to the telescope for their own project. If they don't have those projects, the data that uh, are collected by the telescope are public after a year uh, once the once the data is uh, are, are taken, so a year after the program is done, everybody can have access to the data. Um, and on top of that, uh, Norlab is uh, developing a, a suite of tools um, as well as CSDC in Canada. So um, we we have different uh, institutions uh, working on having a, a an interesting display of those data, so they could be easier to digest, easier to appreciate from um, general people in, in, in the population or uh, astronomy enthusiastic or apprentice scientists. So that's the full answer. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that and uh, those details. And just a, a bit of a follow-up here, um, you were saying that uh, it's open now for, for those who have a, a proposal to submit. Is this the 20, uh, this is 2022B call for proposals? Yes. Okay. yes. And so now is, can, do you have to be an established researcher at an institution to be able to do that? Or um, is, that, is that kind of flexible? So it depends on where you are uh, and it depends what you have to suggest. Uh, it's recommended to be affiliated with uh, a research institution. In some countries, it would be uh, mandatory. Uh, however, if you have a great idea and it goes through the committee evaluating the, the proposal and it just happens to be a great idea and would be curious to see the results, I mean, you may have a chance. Uh, still, if you're by your own just thinking through stuff by yourself, um, my first suggestion would be to try to be in contact with someone who uh, has a habit with the, with the practice and could support you and help you and guide you uh, because it's a, uh, it's a fun yet complex art that requires uh, years of training and patience. Um, and this can hardly be improvised, really. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, those extra details. And I will drop the link there uh, in, the, in the chat uh, for anyone who's interested in learning more about that process. And um, also, I'd like to mention that we do have lots of fantastic images uh, in the NORLAB image gallery from all of uh, the NORLAB facilities, including Gemini. So definitely check that out. I will drop that link in the chat as well. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that reminder. Okay. Um, and one more follow-up question, Andre Nicolam. You mentioned about, um, you know, the... Once John, you know, and the team have the instrument 
delivered and fibers are set up and everything is connected, there's still this uh, more parts, more steps in this process. Now, uh, many people may have been following the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, and knows that it's taken a while for it to fully open and to yeah. be able to realize its potential. Is that kind of like what you're talking about here? Yes, and I will uh, shortly go through uh, certain of the main steps we had to go through. So this cycle, as I'm showing it here, is what is happening like today in 2022. So let's say something started last year. The starting point is I have an idea, the program was created. All of that is being aligned. So we get to the results at the end, the end with a question mark, because it's never really the end. When you find something new, then you open on more questions that you had originally. And that's why this cycle starts over again with a new project and new ideas. Um, but let's go from the day when we received the instrument. So we had a certain set of challenges uh, that we had to face before we could be given the green light for offering the instrument to the community. So John mentioned it a little bit uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. So what we had, we first had to prove it was working. So I'm reproducing here somehow the same chart that he was showing earlier. Uh, the black curve here is how much uh, of the signal you get after one, on, one hour on a very uh, famous star, which, which name is uh, Phage 66. It's, an, it's a star we use uh, regularly for calibrating uh, instruments. And, and so that means that most, most observatories have observed it if they have access to it. And we could, uh, we could compare um, data from other telescopes with comparable instruments of the same star. And okay, you may see sometimes this, the, the, the line goes over, sometimes another line goes under. The point here is that they are comparable. And that's, that's the main take away here. And that in itself is quite extraordinary because uh, John mentioned that we have this extremely long fiber. So for us, it looks like a small fiber, but for the light, and to, to paraphrase what he said, uh, the light is crossing eight and a half uh, football field of glass. So that's a lot of material to go through. And yet at the end, uh, the whole thing acts as if there was no fiber because it, it compares exactly with other instruments that don't have that challenge of a long fiber. So that already was uh, converting a lot of people that were against the project uh, at first because you have to be understanding when you have to make decisions, how to spend that money for running an observatory. Do you risk it into something that you don't believe is gonna work? Uh, and uh, once we could uh, try to save money by starting by first steps, like John said again, baby steps, when we first reached a point we could show it could work, uh, then we got all the support for moving forward. So that was one uh, step. Well, there, there's light, but is that going to give us scientifically valid results? Well, then we observed uh, different types. I have another example here. So this uh, robot, robot head silhouette here is a typical shape of uh, what Gracie's looks like when it's, when it's peeking its head uh, to the sky. And we observe all sorts of objects, uh, planetary nebulae like this one, uh, core of galaxies, AGNs, all different types of uh, astronomical objects to show that uh, the spectra looked exactly as if you had them observed at other places. So that was the first challenge. Then that's one thing, but it worked once. Will it work all the time? Well, you have to make sure that you have uh, good procedures for installing and disinstalling the instrument each time. So here you have a picture of the fiber uh, dangling uh, under the, the telescope. And this has to follow the motion of the telescope as it scans through the sky. Um, that's great, it's working, but when you're done with it, you don't want to leave the fiber there exposed to possible accidents. So you detach it and you pull it down the pier and you spool it down uh, like another two floor down, down the pier. So this is a drawing of, of Gemini. So if you detach the fiber, it has to go down down, down two stories until you get uh, to its storing place and it sleeps there until we use it again. 
when we will pull it up back again and install it in the instrument. So this is the piece that gets into the instrument. Uh, bear with me a little bit. I'll be playing with all along. I'll be playing with um, Zoom a little bit, which is giving me a little bit of trouble. No, that's fine. So um, that's that's the uh, equipment that is at the other end. So on the Gemini end of the fiber, and that gets into an instrument that we already had a Gemini, which is called GMOS. And this had to be installed and removed and reinstalled, removed and reinstalled regularly with everything falling exactly at the same place within millimeters and fraction of millimeters. So achieving that was you know, a technical challenge and it worked. Um, now that's great, but you have all those instrument parts. That's the part that is at CFHT. That is again, our robot, robot head um, at Gemini. Everything has to move within a fraction of a millimeter of accuracy without us having to go touch them with our fingers. So it's all controlled by computers. And this is just an engineering uh, window, which you could click and say, move this, move that there. But that sequence of where each part has to go has to be exact. You cannot just uh, pick randomly one and then for the other, another thing. It has to be an exact sequence, which needs to be um, um, pre-programmed and arranged in a way that will be then gracefully, if I may use that term, uh, align when you use the Gemini tools. So this is just uh, two screens that Gemini, Gemini employee and Gemini users may recognize. Uh, this is the software, the piece of uh, the application we're using for preparing the sequence. So that is something that Kim has seen, uh, something similar to that. And this is where all the sequence is being done. And this will then talk to the instruments and make all the little parts move. There are hundreds of motions happening for one little sequence, for one spectrum. And this has to happen repeatedly without error for years. So that is the challenge. And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we take all the extra frames that need to calibrate the data because the data in itself uh, has flaws that can be corrected if you do the right thing. So those procedures have to be uh, done. And finally, there's the data processing. This is uh, an example of a frame. So the actual image you get is just a series of lines like that. With, If you just look at it like that, there is information, but it's hard to see. So you need something like a machine to grind this data and pull out what you actually do need. And this is how you get those scientific, scientifically valid data you can actually analyze. It turns out that in the development, we ended up with two tools to do that. One is Opera that was developed by our friends at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And the other one is Drag Races that uh, we could develop at Gemini. These are uh, between uh, one or two years of development to a couple of months of development for the two tools. And it's important to have them ready and available for astronomers. You don't want them to have to go through that pain themselves each time. You don't want them to reinvent the wheel. And when you have all that in place, then you have to train the staff. I mentioned there's you know, 70 people being involved in what's happening. You want to make sure that they know what they're doing, that everyone, everyone can focus on their part and everything is aligned. I mean, an observatory is an exciting environment and it's all working about, uh, it's all about working with uh, high technology and high precision prototypes um, and making sure that we all communicate uh, properly for having everything working flawlessly. And so uh, we mentioned it was a crazy adventure. It was an experiment at first. It became an official instrument. Uh, John mentioned that the price for uh, such an instrument was around a million dollar, um, which is far less than a full-blown official instrument. And the advantage is we could very rapidly, like in a year and a half, uh, go from let's do an instrument to having the instrument for a fraction of the price. And we had it for seven years now, and it produced more than 30 people, uh, 30 people, 30 publications, scientific publications. And we're still counting because we know there will be about a dozen more to come in the coming years. Among those, there are two nature papers and two science papers. Those are journals that have high profile, high visibility for very exciting sci science, the same type as, as what uh, Kim presented today. 
And then it filled the gap between not having a spectrograph and the one that is coming, uh, which is named Ghost. And I will stop just with that uh, last figure. You will, you may recognize what I showed earlier. So that would be how Graces performs after one hour observing at this observing, observing this star and then comparable instruments and other telescopes. And this is what we expect the future instrument Ghost to be delivering when it's uh, uh, functioning at Gemini South. And on that, I'll give it back to John, who can, I think, say a few words about that. Yeah, I think it's to me. Uh, uh, well, sorry, to Kim then. <laughs> yes, of course. Can you thank see you. the, you can see the screen all right? Yes. Great. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you both John and Andre Nicola for designing Graces, which has been spectacular. But it is true, as Andre Nicola said, that all astronomers have been waiting for GHOST. This new spectrograph, uh, which John has also been designing and has delivered down to Chile, but through the pandemic, it's been sitting in box boxes. That's an image of it. That's not the actual one. I wish. Um, and and we're just we're just waiting to commission it because the thing about GHOST that is different from Grace's is exactly like Andre Nicola said. This this bump in blue over here. And this is so important to astronomy to actually, when we look at spectra, to getting observations of, of absorption lines at these bluer wavelengths, because there are so many more spectral lines and so many more elements that are available in stars for us to do our analyses of the, the birth of stars, the formation and origin of the elements of the things around us. And so uh, just as going back to that periodic table, the elements that Grace's is able to observe in stars is very limited. And I've put red boxes around those, those. but there's so much more information. Uh, carbon is a really important one. There are several theoretical scenarios that suggest carbon is enriched in the early universe relative to now. So just observing carbon in fossils is something, is a really big science goal to prove that, disprove it, whichever. But there's also many other elements here that tell us about yields from supernovae. And so if I show you this plot, this is also uh, an indication of the abundance of the element, how much of the element is in the star versus the element itself. So it's by atomic number on the bottom or the element across the top. And the solid line versus the dash line are two different theoretical scenarios for the yields of the elements from different types of supernovae. So the dash line is a particular contribution from a 200 solar mass supernova, whereas the solid line is the contributions to the elements from a 60 solar mass supernova that undergoes a very special kind of um, explosion. And the only way to, to distinguish these are to have lots and lots of chemical abundances. So as Andre Nicola says, with GHOST, we actually can get these chemical elements. And so new data can go here, this, the data that we really need the most um, to, to explore the early universe. So I'm very excited about it. Many astronomers are very excited about GHOST. Um, it's one of the worst parts, at least for astronomy, of the pandemic. And so I'd just like to say uh, one more thing, which is not only will GHOST provide us with the blue spectra where we can get chemical elements that we need, but also we're continuing our survey to search for more of these extremely rare and unique fossils or streams. So the survey is actually being done at a different telescope on Mauna Kea, the Canada France Y telescope, which is the other half of GHOST, of, of GRACES as well. It's where the fiber went to. And this gray area here, this is uh, taking the sky, which is above you and projecting it into two dimensional and it's on a piece of paper, which is very difficult to do. So there's a lot of weird projection effects here, but these are images of the sky in the north and a little bit towards the south that we've been looking at with the Canada France Hawaii telescope in with a very particular imaging filter that we think we've designed in order to find metal poor stars. It, it's pretty good when it's combined with other information. And this is how we actually found C19, this little group of blue stars, dark blue stars down here, the, the, mag, the metallicities are down here. So the most metal poor ones are very blue. That's the, the C19 stream that we followed up with Grace's. This other image down here, it's the same projection, but now the objects, the stars associated with individual streams and the namings of the streams are listed on the bottom. So the fact that they're turquoise here uh, is not related to metallicity, it's just trying to put them all together. So we followed up with C19, 
We're planning to follow up with C20. We have observations that start next uh, in about two weeks or maybe even next week that Andre Nicola has prepared for us to follow up on C11. And as you can see, there's several other streams that aren't quite as metal poor, but it doesn't mean that they aren't old or have a story to tell us. And we're looking forward to following up on many of these uh, systems and objects with both the graces and ghost spectrograph for as long as we can. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Jamika. Fantastic. What a wonderfully smooth presentation. You, all three of you had fantastic parts of the story that really brought it alive, definitely for me. Okay, so we have about eight minutes left. And before we move to uh, one question that I, I do have for Kim and then for the rest of, of uh, our panel, um, this is a question to, to everyone. Um, why historically are all elements heavier than helium considered by astronomers to be metals? Can, can someone give us a clear answer to that besides just to make it confusing? I, I, I can probably take that one. Um, well, it's not confusing to us. <laughs> uh, I mean, basically it was a better word than garbage. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm not, I'm not really, I, I don't really mean that because obviously the, these details and the chemical elements are what, what, uh, you know, what we use. These are exactly the tools that we use. The individual amounts of sodium to magnesium, calcium to strontium, a dysprosium to erbium. I mean, it's, it's insane, but there's different yields from different supernovae or different, uh, so that each of these individual chemical elements is absolutely really critically important to us. However, in Big Bang nucleosynthesis, when you start a universe out of basically pure energy, the only things you create are hydrogen and helium because it's creating these particles as it is expanding. So as soon as it makes hydrogen and helium, actually hydrogen deuterium, and then a little bit, and then the, the helium comes after that, the universe is expanding as it's making that, and it does, no longer has the densities required or the heat required to then make heavier elements. It's expanded and cooled. So it can only get through hydrogen, deuterium, helium, little tiny bits of lithium, and then it's just too cool. It can't make the other elements. There's a long time gap before galaxies and stars can form that then form the heavier elements. Heavier meaning, you know, carbon. <laughs> so anything in the metals category. Ah, uh, that. Thank you for that insight, um, John or Andre. Would you like to add anything? Yes, perfectly explained. All right, just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to help clear the confusion <laughs> for all of us. Okay, and so uh, I know that uh, two of our guests are in Canada, um, but here in America, um, March. Uh, March 1st heralds in the beginning of Women's History Month. So if I can begin with uh, Kim. Kim, what role, if any, do you see uh, in your position that you play in advancing or helping to advance um, the welcoming and more supportive environment for women and not just women, but for all underrepresented groups, not only at your institution, but in the field in general? Uh, Janika, that's a really good question. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, to be, uh, astronomy is one of the better of the sciences, science and engineering. Uh, it's about 30% women, but when you look at any other underrepresented group, it's still in the, in the single digits or less, and that's appalling. And so I recognize that I'm in, I'm, I'm in a privileged position. I've had many opportunities and I've been, I've been lucky. I mean, you know, it really, you know, you can't always be sure that you'll get to meet the right person or get the observing time when you need it or get the funding. And so what I try to do is prepare my students, prepare the people around me, uh, help recruit people who, you know, maybe don't feel like they actually belong and they actually do uh, and, and try to, develop a supportive environment here. Um, John is up here and, and can talk more about that uh, within our group. But really the important thing, you know, for the few of us that managed to make it through is to then pass this forward, right? Pay this forward or, or pay it back <laughs> um, by providing opportunities for, for other people. And 30% women are, are, you know, pretty, pretty well supported. It's not great, 
but other other underrepresented groups, uh, we have a lot of work to do, and I am very committed uh, to doing that myself and hoping and trying to share that with my students and the people around me as well. And I just want to say that I feel very fortunate to be working with the Gemini Observatory specifically. Uh, there's a large number of women scientists and engineers in leadership positions. And I actually would like to transfer this question to Andre Nicola because he can talk more about that because he's he's on on um, he's there he's boots on the ground there. Thank you. Well, I can say that I'm in uh, on my tenth year, uh, Gemini, and um, I, I I got to realize I was in an environment that was. Um, reaching the point when you can say, well, this, this is good work because uh, in, in the science uh, group, there are even more uh, female astronomers than, than male astronomers um, by, by a margin, but we're, we're away from the 30%. We're now at the 50% plus or minus variations. Um, so, well, and, and for someone like me, it's I, when I got to realize all the challenges of, of being underrepresented and everything, and I realized that uh, I work in a place where they paid attention of, uh, of not being biased, and yet they, they still picked me. I think this is a great compliment. <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyways, but I'm still, uh, so there are, there are a couple of club with me, but if there could be another Tunisian, uh, I would appreciate that too. <laughs> uh, anyways, it's, it's great to be in an environment where uh, different approaches, cultural approaches, um, life experiences, origins, uh, ways of looking at the world, ways of uh, brain function, uh, come together to tackle the problem and fix it. So um, it's much richer than all making the same mistake the same way in the room. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Those are very great uh, points, Andre. Uh, fantastic follow-up uh, to what Kim shared with us. And John, if uh, we definitely would invite you also to speak on this topic as well, if you'd like to share. Yeah, well, NRC, we also work very consciously to make sure we have an inclusive environment. And we're making sure that we're not being biased in how we view people if we're interviewing we want to make sure that we have an environment that people can really demonstrate what their abilities are without us putting a lens on that causes us to think that, well, that, that person should be smart because they look like what I was taught was a smart person. No, you have to listen to the people. You have to understand, really, you know, listen to what their intelligence is, how they'll be able to contribute, not what they look like. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for that perfect wrap up to what Kim and Andre have shared. And I have to say, I agree with my colleague, uh, Andre Nicola. I am grateful to be in such a diverse and welcoming environment where all of our voices from whatever background are not only able to actually be shared, but we are encouraged to share our ideas uh, and our points of view uh, in a safe in a safe and wonderful environment. And, and of course, we know this is a work in progress. We're all constantly learning and growing together to go forward. And I am grateful that here at NORLAB and all of NORLAB's facilities that this is definitely part of our everyday working environment. Okay, as we are have one minute, about 40 seconds left, I'd like to say thank you so much to each of today's guests, Kim Vin, John Pastor, and Andre Nicola Cheney. So next month, right here on the first Wednesday of April, join us for the next live from the from Noir Lab. This time. It is our In Beeble show from Chile. So that'll be right here on the NORLAB Astro YouTube channel. And for those of you who may have joined us later in the chat, um, we will have the recording of today's presentation um, ready, uh, hopefully by Friday, along with all the links that we dropped in the live chat. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I will leave it to our three guests to end. Let me start with Kim Vin. 
Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And Jamika, you've done an excellent job organizing us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity of being your guest. I'm truly honored to be able to um, share our experiences of making graces and, and uh, presenting the work that we did. Well, I'll conclude by um, thanking Canada France Hawaii Telescope for um, being a, a crucial part in all that we've presented today. Um, and thank you, Jamika, for, um, and thank you, Kim, uh, for inviting uh, John and I to be, uh, so you share the spotlight with us uh, and, and, and bringing us back together like in the good old days. Uh, it's been a great moment I spent with you. Thank you again, Jamika. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you all so much who are in our YouTube audience, and we will say mahalo and aloha.